Well, I trust everyone had a good week. Everybody should be happy today. All of their football teams won yesterday. Uh, Those of us who are Samford fans are not quite as happy. We lost in double overtime last night. Uh, But um, I know certain of you who like the color orange um, went to bed, or I went to bed last night thinking y'all were going to be unhappy this morning. And I woke up to figure out it was something quite different. And so... I guess congratulations are in order. There's a lot in life that brings out our fears. I don't know what makes you afraid, uh, but um, if you look at the screen, you'll see one of the things that makes me afraid. Uh, I am afraid of snakes. In fact, uh, there are only two kinds of snakes, live ones and dead ones. I know, I know the whole argument. I have had people say, oh, well, what kind of snake is it? That's a good snake. No, there, there are no good snakes. There are only live snakes and dead snakes. I am afraid of them. Now, that's a rational fear. Would you agree? To be afraid of snakes is a rational fear. I'm also afraid of clowns. I'll let you decide if that's rational or irrational. Um, but I am afraid of clowns. Uh, in fact, a few years ago, I was sharing lunch with some folks, and um, they knew that I was afraid of clowns, and as we were sitting in the restaurant, there was a whole table full of clowns on the other side of the restaurant. And uh, I purposely, when we went in, told the lady who was seating everyone, I said, we want to sit over here, away from the clowns. And so we went and sat away from the clowns. And a little bit later on, as we were going through our conversation, one of the guys who was sitting at the table with us, I uh, got up, I thought, to go to the restroom. What I did not realize was that he made a stop at the table of clowns. And uh, he got them to play a part in a prank that you see the picture of here. As they snuck up behind me, I am afraid of clowns. Later on, one of the guys who was at the table with us found yet another picture that combined my two worst fears, and I don't know if you can see that or not, but that is a clown with a snake. (laughs) He put that on my Facebook page. I almost had to delete it and start over. Some of our fears are goofy at best, but you know, some of our fears are very real. We look around and we see a world that is in turmoil, And for many of us, that brings fear. There are some people who go into life and they are deathly afraid of failure. I don't want to try anything for fear that I might not be successful. Others fear rejection. Some folks fear change. We don't want the world to keep changing. We want things to be like they've always been. We want at least for things to slow down. Now, I I know that when we really think about that, we really don't. Any of you come this morning in a horse and buggy? (laughs) Most of us came in automobiles, did we not? That's change. And our automobiles are not the same today as they were when they first were introduced. And yet we fear change. Some people fear commitments. And then there are those, and my parents fell into this category, and many of you probably do as well, who grew up during the era of the Great Depression, and there's a fear of a return to financial chaos. Change. Fear. And for some of us, fear is very, very real. Now, I want to I bring this to a level of applying it Not necessarily to our individual lives, although we'll come back to that, but I want to apply this to churches. Because many churches operate from a position of fear. We look around in this room, and some of you sitting there can remember when you would have to get here early to get a seat in this room. When it was full, not just on the floor level, but in the transepts and in the balconies all around us. And we look around and we see that people that we have seen in the past are no longer here and we know that there are more and more funerals that happen all of the time and others who leave or move away. And we we fear. We fear for the future. We, We wonder, what will it be like? You've heard me say this before, but 
we have nearly a thousand churches in the Southern Baptist Convention that close their doors every single year. A thousand churches. In fact, even in our Birmingham Metro Baptist Association, just this past month, we closed another church. And so many of our churches fear for the future. Many of us fear for the future of our church. We fear for things in our personal lives. We fear for things with our families. I, I, we spent the day yesterday with our children and grandchildren. And, and I do, I wonder, what will the world be like for my grandchildren when they grow up? And if I dwell too much on that, it can lead to a place of fear. Because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. And if we allow ourselves, we can, we can quickly enter into a place of fear when we think about the future. But I have a question for you. How can we be afraid, I mean really afraid, with the exception of clowns and snakes, how can we be really afraid when we know Jesus? When we know Jesus, how can we truly be afraid? How can we live a gospel-centered life and still be fearful? In Mark chapter 4, Jesus taught his disciples about living a life of faith that is greater than fear. And I think to best understand this entire chapter, we have to start at the end. So let's look beginning in verse 35 of Mark chapter 4. On that day when evening had come he said to them let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd they took him with them in the boat just as he was and other boats were also with them. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the waves obey? On that day when evening had come is what that, where that passage begins. This, this happens at the end of a day when the disciples had been with Jesus all day long. You know the old song, all day long I've been with Jesus, it has been a glorious day. Well, all day long they had been with Jesus and it had been a glorious day. He had been teaching them about the kingdom of God. And over and over again throughout the day, he would say to them, He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. He who has ears, let him hear. And every time he would teach them, he would say, Guys, are you listening? Are you listening? But they weren't. I mean, they, they heard with their ears, but they didn't really hear with their hearts. They didn't understand. So the storm that raged around them that evening, while they were in the boat, in many ways I think reflected the storm that was raging within their own hearts. And that's where many of us live, isn't it? We, we, we look around us and there is chaos, and, and then we look within us and there is also chaos. And so the disciples were afraid, they were scared. Or... As we would have said growing up in South Alabama, sitting on my neighbor's screened porch, who by the way happened to have been Subtle Mims' sister-in-law, as her sister-in-law would tell us ghost stories, this is the way we would have put it. We were scared. You know, there's a difference between being scared and scared, right? Scared's like when you're really afraid. They were scared. 
And, and the, 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 the fear that they had in looking out around them at the storm was only made worse because of the fear that was also raging within their own hearts. Now, we understand fear can be a good thing, can it not? It can be a healthy emotion. I mean, think about this. If you are afraid to touch a hot stove because you might get burned, fear is healthy. It will keep you from getting burned. But fear can also be a negative thing. If it keeps us from courageously and actively living a life of faith, living the life that God has called us to live, fear can be a terrible thing. Jesus pointed out, faith is the opposite of fear. He says, why are y'all afraid? Do you still have no faith? Fear is the opposite of faith. Faith is the opposite of fear. And faith, the scripture teaches us, comes by hearing. And hearing by what? The word of God. Not hearing with our two ears, but hearing with our hearts. And the fourth chapter of Mark gives us this series of parables that lead us to that truth. Church, understand the gospel-centered life is a life of faith. And it's a life of faith that is so strong, so deep, that it will overcome even our greatest fears. Maybe even our fear of snakes and clowns. These parables reveal some principles of what that faith looks like. And the first is this. You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot give what you do not have. Look back with me at the very opening parable there in chapter 4. And your Bible probably reads just like mine does, the parable of the sower. And certainly that is one way of looking at this passage that there was a man who was sowing seed. And so we look at that and we understand that our responsibility is to sow the seed, the seed of the gospel. And it's not our responsibility where the seed falls. It's not our responsibility, uh, the condition of the soil. But this morning I want us to read this and look at it slightly differently. Not from the viewpoint of the sower, but from the viewpoint of the soil. And think of it as the soil is your heart and it's my heart. And how are we receiving the seed that is there? Again, the scripture says, He began to teach beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat, and he sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching them many things and parables. And in his teaching he said to them, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some of the seed fell along the path. The birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun came, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold and he said he who has ears let him hear faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and this is one of those classic examples of the way that Jesus taught He's sitting there on the boat, again, like he was when we looked last week, and the crowds have gathered around him, and he's sitting there on the Sea of Galilee, there along the shore, and in the backdrop are some hills. And more than likely, those hills would have been farmland. And as Jesus is sitting there, I can imagine that he looks out beyond the crowd, and he says to him, he says, hey, y'all, turn around and look. See that guy up there? He's sowing seed. And he began to teach this particular parable. If we look at the parable from the standpoint of the soil, and we think of the soil as being representative of the conditions of our hearts, we begin to understand a little bit about how faith 
gets rooted in our lives. Remember, we cannot give what we do not have. We cannot share faith if we don't have faith. We cannot live a faithful life if we don't possess faith. So how does that happen? How does faith take root in our hearts? Jesus begins by talking about the pathway. Now remember, a pathway would have been a place where people had walked over and over and over and over again. And as the man is, as the farmer is sowing his seed, some of it is landing on this hardened ground that has been trampled underfoot and it has gotten so packed down that there is no way for the seed to take root. The path represents a heart that is hardened. Now the truth of the matter is, life happens, does it not? The truth of the matter is that we all face different things in our lives, and if we allow those things to do this, they will harden our hearts. Bitterness, disappointments, failures. But for whatever reason, a hardened heart does not hear, does not allow the gospel to take root. Then there is the rocky ground. In this analogy that Jesus is teaching, in the story, in the parable, the seed that lands on the ground that is rocky, it takes root. But because there are rocks in this particular soil, in this particular ground, those roots don't run deep. And so when the weather turns harsh and you get this constant change of weather conditions, the plant that springs up from the root does not take hold and it withers and it dies. Now, if you want to take that and make an application in your life and in my life, in terms of hearing the Word of God and having a faith that, that, that grows, the rocky soil, when our hearts are rocky, it represents a faith that is shallow. A faith that maybe is just on the surface. Or, or maybe it's a faith that is not allowed to grow because the rocks that are there. We all have rocks in our hearts. We all have those things that get into our lives. Maybe, maybe it's unconfessed sin. Maybe it's an attitude of bitterness towards someone else. Maybe it's our own insecurities or maybe a secret that we are afraid that someone else is going to find out. Whatever the case, these rocks in our lives keep us from having a faith, keep the faith from taking deep root in our lives, and therefore we're just kind of shallow, we're just kind of on the surface, and the least little thing can wreck us. The third soil in the parable is the soil that is littered with weeds and thorns. I, I need to share with you all my, my philosophy, my theory of lawn maintenance. Several years ago, we moved into a neighborhood, and uh, the house that we bought, the, the previous owners had not taken very good care of the lawn. And all around me, there were these men who spent hours and hours in their yards, and they had beautiful grass. And so I, I went to the store, and I bought all kinds of chemicals, and I, bought, I spent all kinds of time, and I, there was not a weed to be found anywhere in my yard by the time we got through the first summer. But that's all I did in my spare time was work in that yard, making sure there were no weeds. And so years later, we moved to another house, and, and uh, that yard, well, it probably had more weeds than it did grass. And I realized very quickly that was going to be a losing battle. And what I figured out was this, and this is my theory of lawn maintenance. If you keep weeds cut short enough, they look like grass from a distance. <laughs> the problem is this. The weeds make it impossible for the good stuff to grow. Hello? The weeds make it impossible for the good stuff to grow. Now remember, from a distance, the weeds look good if you keep them cut. It's green. Now it may be multiple shades of green because it's different kinds of weeds all over the place. But it's still green and from a distance, it looks good. And in matters of faith, the weeds are those things that keep us so occupied and so busy to the point that we don't allow the Word of God to take root in our lives. 
Now, many of our churches are living in that spot. We have become so busy doing things that might be good things, but they are not the best things. And we have substituted the weeds for the grass. We have substituted the stuff for the Word of God. And so God's Word in our lives does not flourish, it does not take root, and our lives get cluttered. And we have no time for the gospel because we're so busy doing all of these other things. And y'all have heard me say it before, and our church has become something of a glorified country club that exists to keep me busy and keep me happy and keep me occupied. And, And it's great because we're having fun and we call it fellowship. And fellowship's biblical, right? We've already talked about that. And so we we go to seed on that one thing. And we miss the best thing. So the life that is cluttered, the the life that is littered with weeds and thorns is a life that is cluttered. And these pesky intruders keep coming back. And then there's the good soil. The ground that is ready to receive the seed, the rocks that have been removed, the weeds that are under control, the ground that has been turned, it's soft, it's rich, it's ready. And not only will the seed take deep root, but it will flourish. And it will produce fruit. This is a heart, a life that is receptive to the Word of God. Remember, Jesus taught and explained this parable to his disciples early in the day. This is at the start of the day. The the, the storm is at the end of the day. And by the end of the day, it becomes very apparent that the seed even of that day had not really taken root in their lives. They were still just as controlled by fear as they had been before. So Jesus repeats, he who has ears, let him hear. Folks, we cannot give what we don't have. Faith will never grow in our lives unless our hearts are ready to receive it. That leads to another truth. You cannot keep what you don't give away. Think about that. You cannot keep what you do not give away. What is the fruit? What is the undeniable evidence that you and I have received the good seed and it is actually taking root and flourishing in our lives? What what is the evidence of that? The evidence of that is that people who are around us will see the result. Look at verse 21 again in chapter 4. And Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone again has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use it, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away." You don't hide the light, you don't put it under a basket, you don't hide it in a closet, you put it on a table so that it illuminates the darkness. Now here's the thing, do we have any English teachers in the room, former English teachers? Okay, got at least one. An English teacher would say Jesus was mixing his metaphors. He's gone from seeds and soil to light. And then he goes back to a straight reference to hearing the word of God that produces faith. He says, what we don't use, we lose. The whole point of faith, the whole point of Bible study and discipleship, the whole point of living a gospel-centered life is that we become contagious Christians. That others would see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. You cannot give it away if you don't have it. That's the first point. And if you think you can just hold on to it for yourself, you will soon discover that what happens is that it fizzles and it fades. 
we think of lights and lamps in terms of electricity, don't we? So if you've got a lamp in your bedroom or in your den, and you get a basket large enough to go and put over that lamp, what happens? It just hides the light, does it not? But if you take it off, the light is still there. Did you know they didn't have electricity when Jesus taught this? Were y'all aware of that? They didn't have electricity. And so a lamp would have been an oil burning lamp. What happens to an open flame when you put a basket over it? It is starved of oxygen and therefore it goes out. And so when you take the basket off, it, there's no light. It's dead. It's gone. It has to be relit. Putting our faith under a basket causes it to go out. We lose it. But if faith has taken root in your life, then you are courageously and actively doing God's will. Now, please do not mishear me. I did not say that we lose our faith in terms of losing our salvation. That is not what I said, and that is not what I meant. But we can lose the active faith that we have that allows us to live our lives faithfully and obediently to what God has called us to do because we've, we've not shared it with anyone. We've not given it away. We've not allowed it to shine and to illuminate the darkness. But when we do, when we take what God is doing in our lives and then we then allow others to see it, then it just grows brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. And we become an inspiration to others. We become an encouragement to others. We share our faith, not only by our words, but by our deeds. And when we give away that faith, it is replenished Amen. and multiplied. Which brings us to a third truth. You cannot contain what God multiplies. Amen. You cannot contain what God multiplies. Jesus taught two more parables about seeds. In verse 26, he said, The kingdom of God as, is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. I think there's a hymn to that effect, is there not? But when the grain is ripe, and once he puts, it, puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable shall we use for it? It's like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground, is the smallest of all of the seeds on earth. Yet when it's sown, it grows up and becomes larger than the, all the garden plants, and puts out large branches, so that the birds of the air can make nests in its abode. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. Now, Jesus was using farming as a teachable tool, but he wasn't really teaching about farming. He's explaining how his word takes root in the believer's heart and then produces faith that reproduces faith. Some of you have already heard me make the statement that our responsibility, the, 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 the whole heart of the Great Commission is that we become disciples who make other disciples. That we so let our light shine before men that they see our good works, that we don't hide our light, that we do allow our faith to grow. And it becomes such that it becomes a contagious faith that others want to know about. And as we share that faith with others, then they become disciples and God begins to multiply what is there. That's what Jesus is teaching in this passage about the growing seed. Amen. If we'll just do the work, God will do the work. If we'll just do what He's placed in our pathway, God will take care of the rest. Once the Word has taken root in your heart, the Holy Spirit is the one who causes it to grow. Paul called that the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said it's like a tiny mustard seed. 
I don't think any of us would deny that when we came to faith in Christ, for those of us who have made that decision, the Holy Spirit was at work in our lives. The Holy Spirit brought us to a point of conviction and led us to publicly profess our faith in Jesus, to give our lives to Him. That's what Jesus was describing to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, that we don't understand how the Spirit works, but the Spirit blows, and that's how we become followers of His. But we need to understand that the Holy Spirit continues to work within us even after we become followers of Jesus. When we surrender our lives to Him and allow Him to do His work in us, we experience growth, and that growth cannot be contained. I think one of the things that many of us face is sometimes you really can't see spiritual growth. I mean, sometimes we, 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 you know, if, if I go out and plant a seed in the ground, at some point there's going to be the shoot and then the fruit, right? The seed, then the fruit, then the shoot, then the root. But while it's still in the root stage, you can't see it. And I think for many of us in our walk with Christ, we, 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 we go through those periods and we say, well, I can't see the fruit. And, and so what we do is we, we go back and we get the shovel and we go out and we dig it up. <laughs> because we want to look at it, we want to see, is, is it taking root? You know what happens every time you do that? You've got to start over again. And that's where this matter of faith comes in. As we trust that God is doing what He's doing. That's what happened with the disciples there at the end of the chapter. They've been hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Jesus has been giving them the Word of God all day. And He's planted that seed of faith. It is beginning to take root. And then He puts them in a situation where He says, Okay, I'm going to test to see how much you're learning. So they go through this test and there is this storm and Jesus is asleep in the stern and they panic. How many times do we panic? How many times do we hit the fear button? We hit the panic button. We, 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 we dig up the seed to see what's there. Is it actually taking place? And, and Jesus is saying, I told you. I told you. And he's proven it over and over and over and over again. You know this to be true even more than I know this to be true. You can trust the heart of God. You can absolutely trust the heart of God. There is nothing that you face, there's nothing that I face, that God is not working all things together for good in order to bring Him glory and to make us stronger as believers. And the same can be said for the church. The same can be said for the church. God wants us to place our trust in Him and to be obedient. Not to operate out of fear. Not to operate out of, well, we've got to take care of what we've got because we don't want to lose what we have. God wants us to say, okay, I want you to put it on the line. Do you trust me or not? Are you willing to be obedient or not? Wednesday night we're going through Wednesday nights we're going through the book of Colossians. And this past Wednesday we started looking at that passage in Colossians chapter 1 where we are reminded that Jesus is the head of the body his church. This is his body. The church is the bride of Christ. We are the family of God. Do you not think that Jesus cares more about his church than even we do? So we trust him. Do you not think that Jesus cares more about the situations of your life than even you do? So we trust Him. When the storms of life come, whether they are coming into your life individually or they're coming into the life of the church, what do we do? Remember, you cannot give what you don't have. You cannot keep what you don't give away. 
So our, our, our tendency is, okay, th things, are, things are tough, so we've got to hold on to what we have rather than continuing to give it away. You cannot keep what you give away, what you don't give away. And you cannot contain what God multiplies. Amen. And He wants to multiply in your heart, your faith, and then He wants that to multiply beyond so that there become a multitude of others who are following and believing and allowing the same process to take place in their lives. Church, that is the mission. Amen. It's what God's called us to do. And it begins in your heart, it begins in my heart, and then it overflows from there. Will we be people of faith? Or will we be people of fear? Which will it be? Father, I just want to thank you this morning for bringing us into this place, for calling us to this moment. God, help us to open our hearts that your faith the faith that you want to dwell within us, Father, that, that the gospel message would take root in our lives and, God, that our faith would just be growing and growing and growing and that we would give it away as you bless us, Father, that we would just continue to share it with everyone that we come in contact with. And then we would just sit back in awe as you multiply that faith in our own hearts and in the hearts and lives of others. Oh God, how we thank you. Father, in this moment, perhaps you are speaking to someone in this room who desperately needs to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Someone whose life perhaps is totally overcome with fear. And they need to be reminded in this moment that you love them that Jesus died for them. Father, I pray that you would give them the courage this morning to accept Christ as Savior. And Father, I pray that you would be with us as a church. God, that we would continually step out in faith to do what you've called us to do. To make Jesus known across the street and around the world. As we pray in His name, Amen.